Okay, I guess I'll go first. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. So um, I'm a lot newer to LinkedIn than Cassie is. I've uh, been there uh, just under two years. Um, so some things are still new to me, but joining from American Express, um, where I was for almost seven years, leading um, a UX research and CX insights team. Um, but now I'm at LinkedIn, I'm basically a UX research director across our consumer and premium products. So the app and website that you all hopefully use pretty regularly. Um, and also uh, recently taken over a small but mighty content design team. And so my journey into UX research, um, I'm sure we'll hear many, many different paths. I'm one of those folks that started in design um, and did various uh, roles before all of these disciplines were a discipline. So I've kind of tried my hand at many things before um, settling on UX research. Uh, but I've been leading, leading similar teams for, for a while now. So that's my backstory. Hi, I'm Cassie. Um... I'm Craig's counterpart. Actually, you lead uh, user research for our hiring and job seeking products and our learning products at LinkedIn. I've been here for, um, it'll be eight years in May, believe it or not. Um, that's a whole other story for another day. But prior to this, I also um, had a background in education policy eval evaluation. I see some folks who are more academic researchers um, or coming from academia, so kind of that more tradition. Um, and I also worked in market research prior to that. So I am living proof that you can pivot into UX um, along the way. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here and um, talk to you guys about the UX job hunt. Awesome. And to sort of kick things off today, we know we're here to discuss like, you know, LinkedIn best practices for someone uh, in uh, job during their job search for UX. So I was curious for your perspective on how your LinkedIn profile is different than a resume or is it different? All right, I'll start with this one. Um, so I think the, the first thing that I would say about profile, um, and obviously, you know, this is an internal perspective, some of this, but I'm trying to stay focused on, that, on you know, the external perspective. But I think um, don't think about profile as a static copy of your resume. That's number one. Um, we do see that People tend to think of it that way. They only update it when they change jobs. They only update it when they're looking for a new role. They um, only update it when there might be a new life event. But really, it's dynamic. So you can, the, the most important thing, honestly, is to set um, a signal. So you can indicate that you're open to work. You can indicate that you're hiring. You can indicate there are services that you might want to showcase or services that you might want to offer. Um, or if you're creating content, that's actually a setting that you can put in your profile as well. Um, so really think about setting the intent because that's very, very important also from a platform perspective. Those are some of the signals that we use to inform what you see, who we might suggest you connect to, um, some of the content that gets surfaced. And then I think the other thing is um, if you're thinking about it as dynamic, there are other sections on there like recent activity. So if a recruiter or a connection is looking at your profile, one of the first things they're gonna see up top is your recent activity. And you can choose to highlight anything you want in there. It could be a project you've worked on, it could be a video introduction, it could be a link to an article you've written or a website. So I would kind of think of it as, how do you want to best represent yourself? What's the story that you want to tell? And most importantly, what are you looking for? So it shouldn't just be a list of qualifications or experiences, um, but a snapshot. What's what's the narrative that you want people to see? Um, and then I think the the final piece before I, I have Cassie chime in is, I know a lot of people get endorsements. Don't make the endorsement general. Don't have it about you as a person. I'm sure you're fantastic and you're amazing to work with, but we're going to talk about specific skills and skill sets and and you know how you're you're part of um, you know, that pool that are being pulled into the recruiter search, get endorsements for specific things. So you know, know what you're good at, ask for specific recommendations and endorsements, and really think about how all the sections come together to tell that story. Go ahead, Sam, you want me to chime in? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I um, run the research team that works on the hiring side. 
So one of the things that I love to share with folks who are job seeking is a little bit about how recruiters and hiring managers use our platform. Because um, I think that's really important to know and understand um, as their, their process and their workflow. Um, so just to build a little bit on, on Craig's points around what's the story you want to tell, what recruiters and hiring managers are, are most looking at is um, how you showcase yourself. So that could be a little bit in um, either that narrative that Craig was just discussing. Often we see it in the about section. It's who do you want to be in the world? You know, what makes you different from everybody else that's also job seeking right now? Um, and that could be passion areas, that could be things you've studied, that could be, um, that some does sometimes include skills um, that become really important and I'll talk about why in just a minute. Um, it could be, you know, the focus areas. So in research, we have folks who really wanna focus on certain types of work, um, that that's really important to them and how they wanna to give to the, the UX community. Um, so thinking about that is really important because it signals to the recruiter or their hiring manager um, whether or not you probably would be a good person to even reach out to, or am I just wasting my time? Um, the, the most thoughtful recruiters, by the way. Um, and then the other thing is, is around you know, your experience. So um, the very first thing, I've actually done studies on this where you look at how um, recruiters kind of scan the page. So uh, that, that top piece is really critical. And then your most recent positions, your last probably two or three positions are most critical. Um, your, obviously your title and your role and where you worked is great. Adding even a bullet or two about what you did there. Um, and so the things that I would encourage you, I'm also a hire, Craig and I are hiring managers on our team. So we can also talk about what do we look for um, and some of that is also things around. So now we're not talking just about your technical skills, but um, so if you think about that's the what you do, it's also the how you like to do it. So a lot of us are listening for and recruiters and hiring managers are listening for um, leadership collaboration, um, engagement with partners, right? Impact and influence inside um, the work that you've been doing um, and storytelling, right? That's kind of ultimately what a lot of UX is. So how can you demonstrate that through um, either the work that you've done or projects that you're excited about it becomes really, really important. Um, the other thing I like to say is, so I'm gonna talk about keywords for just a minute if people will indulge me, cause I get this question a lot, which is, um, Many people who are applicants, you know, this is where the resume comes in. Not every company uses our profile as your record when you apply to a job. So you do have a, a resume as well. And kind of trying to understand how keywords are used. Um, and so how I think about this a lot is, is a little bit of like a push and a pull mechanism. When you're applying to a job, you're pushing yourself in to be considered for a candidate pool. Um, and you can imagine, especially bigger companies are using a lot of machine learning to basically identify how well do you meet the job description that's being posted in the world. And the simple fact is, is that keywords are kind of an in and out <laughs> when you get to machine learning. So you wanna be in the pool. So may, making sure you're paying really close attention, I would encourage you to be honest and be you know, forthright about your ability and experience as far as how you match to those skills. Um, but if you have you know, skills and experience that's reflected in those job descriptions, include it. Um, the other side of that on the, then the LinkedIn side, how people, a lot of recruiters use our tools is to then pull candidates to them. So they're creating a candidate pool. A lot of folks who include not just people who are actively looking for work, um, but many of you may have been contacted if you've been already employed and have recruiters reaching out to you about new opportunities that might be of interest to you. It's pretty common called passive sourcing, um, but we're looking to pull candidates to us um, who we wanna consider. So keywords become important in the profile, um, again, for the same reason, as they build search queries, very complex, Boolean big search queries that include a lot of these keywords, right? So making sure that you get considered into the pool um, as uh, recruiters and hiring managers are doing that outreach, I think becomes really important. I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple of questions teed up, actually. Um, so Nidhi asks, uh, how much information on LinkedIn profile is, is too much information? Um, and I think you just spoke to this, but there's also a follow up on like, you know, what differentiates a strong profile from others on LinkedIn? Yeah, I can start, Craig, and then you should chime in, too. Um, let me tell you that, honestly, I rarely see too much information. <laughs> I actually think the other side is more common where I think 
I, we've done a lot of research on the profile, um, and Craig should talk about that, but we understand that people struggle with like the, the, um, how to present yourself well. And so, um, you know, I personally look for a lot of inspiration and in, in from other people's profiles and how do they talk about themselves and, you know, what resonates with you as far as the language and the framing. But again, I think if you're thinking about the role, all these jobs are gonna ask you to think about how you qualify. So the what technically can you do and how do you like to do it? So do you feel like you've answered enough about that question um, in upfront? Are you just really clear about, you know, what's the type of UX professional you wanna be in the world, right? Um, so I think if you can demonstrate that through your profile, that really helps a lot. Um, I think, I think there's rarely, you can hear my cat, you guys, sorry. My cat's decided to make an appearance tonight. Um, uh, I think you rarely see too much information. I guess what I would say is, um, and this becomes important, uh, particularly in the UX field, is more about the what information are you sharing. So I would just be very cognizant, especially if you are currently working or freelancing or contracting, who are you working with? You know, what permission do you have to showcase work? Um, in great detail. So this kind of gets to like, I know folks are interested in portfolios and you know where other work is being demonstrated. Just being mindful of um, how much potential intellectual property you're sharing. Um, so that's that's just a tip, I think. And, and that's more where uh, it doesn't happen very often, but when you see it in a profile, you know, I would just urge caution. Um, you know, you can be respectful of the organizations you're working with and share that you're working on a not yet launched product or feature or something like that. Um, and it can be in a space. You don't have to be so specific about it. Um, I hope that answers that. Yeah, I, I, I would just add, um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily how much is too much. I think it's about the specificity of the information. So, you know, think about it almost in terms of an elevator pitch. So what's the about section up front? What is the highlighted activity that you're choosing to put at the top? Um, if you're after a specific type of role, are you highlighting specific types of research? Because we know there are many flavors of UX research. There are many paths into this career. Um, if you're someone that is saying, I've done this, 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 you're making, obviously as researchers, we know it becomes, you know, there is such a thing as um, cognitive load. Are we making it harder for someone to parse the information versus easier and matching what we're presenting with the opportunity that we're seeking? So I think um, that, but also definitely looking at other profiles that you find interesting and analyzing what about it, what about them draws your attention, what that stand out to you, and is that something that you want to emulate um, versus necessarily listing you know everything that might be on a resume. Um, it is it is a completely different um, format, so you need to kind of think accordingly, and you're trying to draw an audience in. There, 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 there obviously is, you know, as Cassie said, um, all of the machine learning and AI involved in the background. But at the end of the day, if if you're in that final consideration pool and you're, you know, in the list of however many people, someone will be reading your your profile and you know actually looking closely at the content and clicking on the links and and trying to parse that. So I think that's the thing to bear in mind. Um, are there great ones that, and, and what inspires you about them? I think we have one final question to sort of wrap up this topic before we move on. Um, and it's just, I think it's this conversation around like how much information you put on LinkedIn, the buzzwords, et cetera. Like, what do you recommend around like uploading your resume in a Word or PDF? Like, is that helpful or is it better to just have the information in LinkedIn? I, I I I don't see any harm in both, honestly. Um, better to have it than not have it. Uh, and you know, it, I, 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 you don't want to fall fall afoul of some process where you know someone technically needs a resume um, for you to be eligible when it's not there. I think just make it easier for them to access if they need to. Yeah, I think um, it's I think it's a really smart idea. I will say. Some roles, I think many of us customize a little bit of our resumes. So I'm very, this will be maybe speak more to pivoters um, who you may have some options on the table of what exactly are you pivoting into. Um, this also goes to the, maybe the conversation around how you look at other people's profiles and how do you want to showcase your experience. Um, so you may have resumes that represent slightly different facets of your work 
that w that resonate best for a specific company, right? So what I, I guess I would say is, is if you have like a, a general base resume that you feel comfortable being publicly available to recruiters and hiring managers, that's great. Um, knowing that you're probably gonna still do some customizing as you find specific roles that you're interested in, I think that's totally reasonable. Um, one of the things I will say about this, maybe just to close on this topic for my Pivoter friends out there um, is uh, advice that served me really well, which is um, that other thing around looking at other people's profiles of the, the area you're trying to pivot into. So um, having come from policy research into market research and now into user research, um, one of the things that I think is really is really frustrating, but also really typical is we actually use a lot of the same methods. We just call them different things. Um, and so learning the language of UX specifically becomes really, really critical. Um, learning the language of design of which UX is, you know, especially for research, a part of, but research can be applied in a million different ways. Um, so do you have the understanding of the language of the field that you're trying to move into? And is that reflected back in your profile um, and your resume? I think that's one of the things when I do mentoring and I talk to folks, I see is probably a gap right now. Um, and really encourage them to go back and think about their the way that they're showcasing their experience and does it sound like UX or does it sound like something else, um, which potentially, again, limits them to being considered in the pool um, when, our go when our goal is to get you into the pool for consideration. That's, that's a super interesting call out, like every day at work, you know, we work with at Facebook, a lot of uh, market science research, market researchers, UX researchers working together and calling the same thing like a study and immersion. We have all our own buzzwords. So we're, you know, we're routinely, routinely running into that too. Um, and I think sort of we can go into the next topic that's kind of related, uh, uh, but also separate is the, the conversation around research portfolios, right? So for UX researchers, um, do we need it? Yes, no. What's, what are your thoughts on that? So funny, we were talking about this a little bit. Um, I've gotten this question a lot lately, and I'll tell you that I probably come from the school of like, what portfolio? <laughs> um, but clearly if people are asking, you're getting asked about it. Um, so my my personal guidance at LinkedIn, we don't ask for a research portfolio. What we really mean is having a piece of work that you are ready to showcase. Um, so part of our hiring process is to walk through a case study example of your work. Um, for research specifically, I think design is a little different, but. For research specifically, it's kind of the end-to-end -end project so that we understand um, what we're really listening for is things around your um, problem-solving skills, you know, the critical thinking, how you apply research to a business problem, um, the methods that you choose and why, you know, who you want to talk to and why, why not other people, why not other methods, how did you think about that decision? Um, who gets included in your research? So who are your stakeholders that you think about or are included in that process with you? Um, you know, the, what, what did you learn? And I don't mean literally, but, but the like, what did you do about it? <laughs> so what? The kind of the so what of the story. Um, so impact, influence, results. Um, and then all of that is kind of tied in this beautiful bow of the storytelling, right? The, the, um, which is, I think, a really hot topic in UX right now. But the how you convey that information um, becomes really, really critical to a case study. And so I think as long as you feel like you have a piece of work you're really proud of, that you feel like you can showcase and talk to with confidence and clarity, um, that's really great. I think if that's a piece that you would like to put into, you know, um, a publicly accessible site that is a portfolio, um, or if you have a set of projects that you want to do this for, I think that's awesome. Um, I would, again, I'm gonna just remind people, especially as researchers, we're privy to a lot of inside information, both on behalf of our companies um, and on behalf of the people that we talk to, the human beings that we talk to. So just being really thoughtful about, you know, masking IP or data and certainly making sure you're taking out any, um, what we call PII or publicly identifying information, personally identifying information so that if that's available to people outside of you know, you and your particular team that you're working with, um, they were just being really respectful and sensitive. I can tell you as a hiring manager, I've had that access given to me and I've seen that information and that's actually so core to our practice that that would probably exclude you from moving further in my process um, because we protect our privacy and security so much. Um, we wanna be really, really thoughtful about that. Um, hopefully that answers that. I think that's, that's I know is a very hot topic in the, um, 
in the community right now. Um, I think maybe Craig, I think you come with more of a, a bit of a design background. So folks who are kind of in those hybrid yeah. roles, you might feel a little differently on this. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, I guess, you know, it's it's obviously much more common traditionally as a, as a designer go, applying for design roles. And I know that's kind of bled into UX research a little and, and that's where this question is coming from. I think if you do have a portfolio, just make sure that it's clear what experience you want to dial up and show in that portfolio. And I think this is a something that, you know, if if you're at the beginning of your career and maybe you've started as a generalist, it's it's sometimes a bit of a trap that people fall into where because you you've done a generalist role, you might have done some UX and some visual design and you've started off doing some research and then you discovered that you had a passion for research and that's what you want to lean into. Those are the things to dial up in the portfolio if you're interviewing with a company that would like you to show one. And, and I, I don't think it's about portfolio in the traditional sense of, you know, here's some amazing um, visuals of a product that launched. As Cassie mentioned, it's really about your thought process. What decisions did you make? Why did you make them? What was the impact of those decisions? What, what changed as a result? So I think it is, at least for research, more much more on the case study aspect and showing your thinking, but being clear, like even if you play, even if you wore multiple hats in that process or you had multiple roles, um, what is what are the parts that you really want to dial up and talk about and make sure that comes through? If there's a mismatch between a portfolio or a link that someone's reviewing versus what's in your profile versus the job that you're applying for, that that mismatch, um, you know, can be really negative. So I think being hyper hyper conscious about that too. We have a couple of follow-up questions on portfolios. Um, what is more important during an interview presentation? Is it finding something that to present that's in the domain of that company, or is it more important to present something that is more recent? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, recency matters. So I will only speak to that first, and I'll work backwards to kind of the domain. Um, I've talked to folks, uh, we've interviewed folks who pulled case studies of projects that they were really excited about that are maybe three years old. Uh, and I would say, and especially in a lot of um, tech specifically, things move fast. So three years is actually an eternity. <laughs> and if you've worked on a lot of projects in that period of time, you want to be conscious of how fresh is that project to you right now. Um, so that, because I think one of the things that happens in the interview process is we do we do get into the details of those case studies and those stories. So if you are gonna pull um, a project that's you know a couple years old, I would just be really, really mindful to go refresh yourself fully on the whole project, because that's what we're really, we're really gonna be interested in the details at that point. Um, so I think the other piece around whether or not it needs to sit in the domain that you're trying to go to, I mean, personally, this is again, this is maybe hiring manager preference out there in the world, I'm less precious about this. Um, I'm really proud of the kind of the diverse range of our team. So we have folks who've come from healthcare or from, um, you know, uh, uh, obviously Craig came from, you know, financial services. Um, we have folks who have backgrounds in architecture and art history. And, you know, you can imagine like, again, research is research on the research side. Um, design might answer this conversation a little differently. But I think what we're really listening for is your critical thinking skills. Um, we are a digital platform. So I will say understanding your experience with digital experiences is really, really helpful. Because I think there are some real differences as you kind of get into you know, hardware or customer experience spaces. And so how do we um, you know, understand your skills and your experience in a way that would translate quickly into a digital experience, I think is really important. Um, but I personally don't mind hearing from folks who who haven't worked in, you know, social media, for instance. We hire a ton of people that aren't in social media, for sure. And we have another question um, as a follow up to like the PII and sharing of sensitive data. Um, what are your thoughts on presenting that possibly sensitive data in an interview rather than having it hosted on the portfolio? Is that all right? Any considerations to keep in mind? Yeah, um, let me see if I make sure I understand the question. So I'm gonna put a stake in the ground and say never share, you know, user data. <laughs> I hope it's not what we're asking. I think you mean probably more like company 
um, IP or like data from the study itself. So um, I think it's totally fine in like a one-on-one. -on -one. I, I do a lot of our case studies to share a little bit more context around um, the study that you were running or the, the space that you're looking at. Um, I think to Craig's point earlier, like I, I rarely, honestly, I've reviewed hundreds of case studies, so I personally can't remember all of the details anyway. I know people get very sensitive about this. Um, I think if you were worried about it, particularly quantitative data, I think is usually where this comes up most sensitively, um, is to mask the data. So that could be creating dummy data, and you can just tell us that when you're running your, through your story. Because I'm literally not looking at like what you found out. I don't, we're not doing anything with that data, right? So it's more about how the data, how you're choosing to showcase the data in your story. Um, and what is it that you want me to understand about your choice of including that particular data point or you know insight or experience um, that you want to showcase as part of that story? Does that I saw somebody chimed in, so hopefully that was is helpful to you. Yeah, and I think really, um, why why did you get it and what did you do with it and what happened as a result? So obviously, you know, masking it, redacting it, etc., talking about it in a bit more abstract, but. Um, yeah, I, I think if, if you choose to include it, it's great that it is abstracted, but why is it there in the first place? So um, all of the all of the health warnings that Cassie just said, but but bear in mind if you're putting it in there, then it should be in there for a reason, whether, you know, however you choose to display it. Maybe I'll make one more point about that before we move on, because I think where people get actually super sensitive, so you can swing the other way, which is like, I can't talk to you about any of the work I'm ever doing. It's gonna be really hard for us to help you find an opportunity if you can't talk about your work. Um, so again, like, can you showcase a story or an example project, um, particularly in very innovation-oriented spaces? So you might be working on really cutting-edge spaces, which is super cool. Um, is there a way to showcase that work to us in a way that doesn't feel threatening? Um, I remember I did a study once with somebody who was working in um, I think it was like a health sciences division of like an IBM Watson type lab. I don't know if it was that specifically. And they were very reticent about sharing. I was like, I can guarantee you we're not building anything that looks like IBM Watson. <laughs> so, you know, if you're not actually in competitive spaces, I think you can maybe feel, maybe think about that. Um, I am, when we are doing case studies and you should check with the company, but typically we're under NDA both directions. You know, our expectation is we're all professionals. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to share anything you're sharing with me outside of our conversation. And I'm also hoping that you are not going to share anything about what we talk about outside of our conversation, right? Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. And I've just been like monitoring sort of some of the comments in chat and Q&A. Um, and we knew this would come up uh, and it's come up early. So I think we should sort of, instead of going to the next in the order, probably switch to talking about the junior conundrum. Uh, so most jobs I seek ask for experience, but I'm still building my experience. What do I do? Yeah, this is a big one. And so um, actually, if you follow up with Craig and I on the UX Coffee Hours platform, you'll see um, that's mostly who we're talking to. <laughs> Um, is how can we help you guys position yourselves um, for those opportunities and roles? Um, I think there's a couple ways that you know we we have in mind that we would recommend. Um, certainly, while you're in school, um, or if you're going back to school, you know definitely getting that internship. Um, if you can, paid internships are a thing. Find one. Do not accept an unpaid internship. <laughs> um, these are great pathways into an organization and a really great way to, again, create that that um, that portfolio or case study piece that we're just talking about to share later on an example of work. Um, one of the other ways that we've talked about a lot, um, both Craig and I have experience um, and work with people um, on both sides of this, is kind of like agency work um, or freelance contracting work. Um, these are really great ways to get your foot in the door. Those could be short-term engagements or um, you know, even on an agency side, you could be working within the agency and thinking about like design agencies specifically um, or agencies that have designers and research as part of that practice or, or content design as part of that practice where you can get a lot of great exposure and experience in that first year. Um, I think what we're really talking about, my, my sense is this is the first year to two years. Once you get through that first two years, it's really not 
a challenge. It's a different, different, you're, you're facing different um, challenge spaces. So you might consider if you have an opportunity to pair up with um, uh, a contracting agency or um, a, a design agency of some kind. Um, the other one is uh, around, um, and this would be particular for research, so I don't know how this would be in design, but um, within the research community, I would say there's a lot of great opportunities with our partners, like our tool partners, vendor partners. So um, for instance, I'll name drop a couple just because I'm big fans of their work is folks like Answer Lab and DScout, you know, user testing, user Zoom. These are tools that our teams are using every single day. So it's just kind of you're on one side of the conversation or the other, um, but it gives you a lot of great experience. And I think I actually came from um, a consultancy background myself. And what I loved about it was the ability to work with a lot of different client types, actually, a lot of different spaces, a lot like especially early on was just so much exposure um, before settling into tech. So I actually worked in healthcare, telecom, insurance, um, you know, energy and utilities, like all kinds of fields, hardware, software, you know, with decision makers or end users. So kind of getting a full set of like all the different possibilities um, before actually focusing in on a specific um, space or, you know, user type even. Those would be some initial thoughts. I know kind of going back to Craig's point around the generalist path, I wonder, Craig, if you want to talk about that as an entry point too. Yeah, I, I think, I think the, you know, it obviously depends on the size of the company and, you know, what they're looking for, but they're, there seem to be many more opportunities now where where people are dipping their toe in the water and starting with a team of one. And, you know, we always get the question, you know, okay, I'm I'm a UXer and I'm also now required to be a Swiss Army knife. I'm required to do everything. I think if you're comfortable with that kind of challenge, then it's it's one worth meeting. Um, because usually those are more entry-level positions. Um, you know, it may be a small team, they may not have budget to hire, you know, a full staff with all the disciplines, but they're starting with one person. And if you're someone that is, you know, a more recent graduate, or you've um, been to General Assembly and, and, you know, done some of their courses, the, the kind of um, curriculums that you go through tend to be a bit more holistic for those types of reasons. So I think, you know, that's, that's another possible entry point. And then you can, you know, build towards your preference if you want to go in a particular direction. I've seen that be a much more common route probably over the last two or three years. There are a few questions that would be, uh, I think, good follow-ups to this discussion. So I'll just kind of go through them. Maybe we can do like uh, them round robin style. Uh, one of the questions is, what do, you, what do you feel about passion projects or you know independent projects, academic projects uh, being showcased? Uh, as experience, especially since a lot of uh, a lot of the interviews ask for you know impact of your work. Craig, you should start that one. I think you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday too. Yeah, I, I, passion projects are are great, and I think um, it gives a sense of character. It gives a sense of what you're excited by, what you're looking for. You know who you who you want to be, what impact you want to make in the world. As long as there are I, I would say try and show a range of examples, obviously depending on how much time you have. But I think the, the key watch out is if you're if you're presenting to a company, one of the things that Cassie and I were speaking about last night actually was don't present a project to that company about their work if you're not fully baked in their context. Because number one, you're probably gonna be telling them things they already know. Number two, they're going to have context that you don't. Number three, it's going to be very difficult to demonstrate impact if it's theoretical. Um, and so I think with a passion project, that's totally fine as long as you can demonstrate some of the things that we've talked about. I think um, if there's a space that you know particularly well and you can bring that context to life, that's the key. So, you know, how are you... Um, displaying your knowledge in that subject matter and the skills and knowledge that you've applied to it, that's that's really what comes into play rather than, you know, we often, we often get um, people looking at, at spaces that they think are ripe for innovation, but may not be for, for a variety of reasons that they may not know about. So I think that's, that's the key thing to bear in mind. 
Maybe one other thought on this um, that we also talked about is, so there's kind of the self-directed passion projects, um, which is I think what Craig is talking about of like, um, uh, this is probably more common in design, honestly. I don't know that this is a big, like, I don't know how many of us are like off doing research projects that nobody asked us to. <laughs> I think I see a lot more design. Like, I think design loves to have like creative ways of expressing like, oh, what if I redesign a homepage experience or, um, you know, a, um, onboarding flows or something like that, which is really fun. Um, and that's a real clever way of kind of showcasing your also your like visual and interaction design skills. Um, I think for research, one of the things I have seen that I think is potentially really helpful um, that I would say maybe fits more in the passion project, if we can call it that, is um, opportunities to work with um, maybe nonprofits that you care about or, you know, um, organizations that are that are, you know, community based organizations that you really care about that potentially don't really have, um, uh, you know, researchers in house but they could use some help. Maybe they're redesigning their website or looking to understand how do they create growth into their um, nonprofits and what have you. I think that comes up actually quite a bit. And so I've seen there's both um, actual channels that you can do this. I was trying to find it yesterday. It's not designed for good, but it's something like that where you can connect with um, an organization that will pair you with kind of, you know, nonprofits and social good where you can do those projects and the mutual benefit is they get insights from your work you get an example project to showcase, which I think is really cool. Um, or if you have ones that you're already, you know, um, involved with in the community, it's pretty, it's, I, I, I can't imagine too many folks are not gonna be interested in your help, right? Anything we can do to help um, those organizations foster growth or engagement with their communities, I think is really helpful. Um, so those are projects that I think actually could be really meaningful because I think what you're able to showcase is the problem statement that you're trying to solve for. I'll go back to like the story we're listening for, the problem statement that you're solving for, who are you working with it, uh, you know, on it with, um, what did you choose, what did you learn, and you know, impact may be a little different inside that type of working model, but what what potentially did they do with that, you know, or do you understand what they did with it? Um, I think it could go a long way. Awesome. Uh, I think we should keep going. We have we have a few more questions, but maybe we can get get to them in the end if we have time. Um, one question which sort of I think sets us up for the next topic on how to use LinkedIn uh, to stand out for opportunities. Um, we have a person here who says, you know, they're hoping to get into an augmented reality, virtual reality space uh, in, in for their next uh, next job in their career, but they don't want to tip off their connected coworkers that they're eventually going to look for a job. So, any tips on that, and then maybe we can tee up the topic of like LinkedIn uh, tips in general. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely delve into the audience settings. Um, you know, there's you do have granular choices in there about you know who sees which updates. Um, even when you create a post, uh, you can choose the audience that that's going to. Same thing for updates to your profile. Same thing for you know even if you're indicating that you're open to work, definitely pay attention to all of the privacy settings that are in there, and they're in there for that reason. Awesome. And then maybe Craig, you can kick us off on the topic of, you know, how to use other parts of LinkedIn to stand out for opportunities. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I think the, the first thing to kind of focus on is that a big part of LinkedIn and our platform is being part of an active community. And so what we mean by that is we want you to find ways to get help, ways to be informed, ways to build relationships, ways to find the right opportunities. Um, and so I think one um, kind of mistake or, or one one thing that people fall into is, you know, you, you put your experience on there, you think it's a version of your resume, and then you try and connect with as many people as possible, which, which probably isn't the best way to go about it. I think, you know, again, intention really matters. So I think that the first thing is, you know, if you're starting out and you're early in career, you may not have a lot of connections, that's okay. So start by looking for others in the industry that pique your interest and you don't have to connect to them. You can follow them. And actually just by following them, that's going to improve what you see in your feed. It's going to improve what we recommend to you. Um, it's going to basically, the suggestions that you get on the platform are going to be better as a result of doing that. And you can also follow companies and pages. It doesn't even have to be specific people. So I think then thinking about the community piece, 
um, how do you showcase your interests? How do you showcase your, your passion, your point of view in the field um, and connect with people on similar topics? Um, it's important to um, interact with what you're seeing in your feed. So if you like something, if you comment on something, that's then going to get you into the conversation. Um, and that's that's really key to then starting like interacting with that community. And I think also, you know, something that people don't tend to realize is if you go into something like the My Network tab, there's a lot of recommendations in there for you. Like the newest one would be online events. So obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. Everything is moving online. There are a ton of events on there and more being added every single day. So go in there, see what's available, um, join you know as many as you're able to, and then follow the discussion. Follow the discussion beforehand, follow the discussion afterwards, see what recommendations you get as a result. Um, the other thing that you can search for is groups. So we have groups on LinkedIn, um, again, based around key topics, based around interests. And then there are newer features like stories, which you may have seen. So um, you know the ephemeral 24 hours, the circle was at the top of the profile. Obviously, people are, you know, um, posting stories to highlight something in their workday or something they want to show off. You can use that to build your own brand, to show off your own interests, to show off a project that you might be proud of. Um, and again, look at the settings, like, is it public? Is it shown to everyone? And start to, you know, pull people in, you know, towards you, like, you know, get attention that way. Um, there are other things like polls, you know, you can post a quick poll to start a conversation. Um, and then finally, things like, you know, we have news and, and editorial on there. So are you subscribed to the newsletters? Um, have you set up job alerts? Um, as well as all the things that we talked about on profile. So, you know, if you're looking for a role, have you set you're open to that you're, you're open to work or you're open to hiring? Um, so I, I think, you know, just, just doing all the things that will help um, the platform and the system serve you better it's really important to take advantage of those rather than just going in cold and going, okay, there's nothing here for me. What do I do with it? Yeah, I think there's one question and you might have already touched upon this, uh, but maybe we can expand just a little bit. Um, do you have any advice to stand out for UX research jobs that you're applying to? Um, and Victoria asked this question because she's apply she's preparing a UX study, a case study right now for a job that she's applying for in San Diego and she wants to know how she can stand out to the hiring manager. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, Definitely. The, the other thing that people may not realize is people will always see recent activity at the top of your profile. So make sure that your recent activity reflects the things you want to highlight. Um, there's the featured section in the profile that I know that we talked about. So make sure what's in featured is the right thing. And then if you are um, wanting to kind of showcase what's different about you as a researcher or your point of view, start to start to post more often start to create stories start to build an audience and you know then then you're going to have more people interacting with your content and that's a good way to show that you're you either are a subject matter expert in this field or you're building subject matter expertise um the other the other one that's kind of like uh not not a secret, but kind of gets thought about maybe last is learning. So if you're if you're a subscriber and you're building your skills and you're going into LinkedIn learning, you can reach out to the instructors. You can follow the debate around the course. You can comment on the recommendations and interact with those people. So I think it's you know showcasing what you want to showcase, building the right audience, and interacting with people um, in that sphere uh, and trying to join the dots. Yeah, so the way I'm gonna, I, love, I just love hearing Craig talk. Um, the way I'm gonna sum that all up, because I think I was trying to get back to Victoria's question, which is really about demonstrating passion and presence, right? Um, one of the things I think is really common in UX, um, I think, so I'll, I'll be honest, I had this when I first started in UX and I, I moved over from market research as, I felt like an imposter. And I've been a researcher for a long time, <laughs> but I still felt like I was starting over and I felt like an imposter. So really digging into um, the area to build your confidence, to develop a point of view, 
be flexible about it, by the way. Like, don't be married to a point of view. Maybe you'll change it. But, you know, at least establishing one and having a, a, a presence to start with. Um, I think there are, to Craig's point, there's some really great conversations happening. You know, um, so LinkedIn obviously is one place to do that. Twitter, there's the design Twitter community is really something. Um, and it is, it can be uh, quite a conversation set happening over there, but I think it is interesting to follow along with what are people talking about and then think about what do you think? Do you have a point of view on this topic? Do you have something to say about it? Do you have, you know, a way to participate in that conversation? Um, you know, people also uh, potentially have even more to say, like Craig was saying, is around being, building a subject matter expert. So if there are areas that you are really passionate about, um, so that could be, you know, really hot topics. I, I pay attention a lot to the really hot topics and trends within the, the UX community. Um, so maybe three to five years ago, it was really around um, privacy and, um, you know, data privacy, privacy in our products. Um, do you have a point of view about that? That's still, a, by the way, that's still a hot topic. It hasn't gone away, but we've added to that uh, topics around equity. So what do you think about that in terms of the work that you're doing or you want to be doing? You know, how does how does that show up in your practice? How do you want it to show up in your practice? Um, accessibility, right? That's going to be super important. It is already, it needs to be more pronounced in our practice um, about creating products that everybody can use. Um, you know, inclusion, who are we building for? Are we listening? <laughs> uh, so I think like having, um, you know, just getting really into the areas that you're actually also most interested about. I would be authentic about that. You don't have to talk about everything. Um, but how can you participate in conversations that really do light you up? Because I think that's also how you best showcase yourself. Um, so I hope, Victoria, that answers that specifically. Um, in the case study itself, and I've like written a post about kind of my conversations with mentees over the last year. So if I can send that to you, I'm happy to. But I actually will outline for you literally how to write a case study. <laughs> There's, it's the chapters that I keep talking about. It's like, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the problem the business brought to you? How did you decide to address it with research specifically? There's a lot of tools we can use to address these types of problems, but what, what can research do? Um, what did you choose to do about it? What was the method or the way that you went about it and why? Who got included in that conversation? Um, you know, who are your partners in that conversation? What did you learn? What did it do? And then how did you pull that all together in a, in a meaningful story to share with us? Um, I, that's, it's, it's every single case study I've seen, that's what I'm constantly listening for. But passion and presence is actually a, th a through line to this. So that's really part of your storytelling as a device as well, um, if that's helpful to folks. Yeah, and j just going back to the passion project for a second, I think, um, where I've seen this be a really interesting story is, you know, no matter where you are in your career, if if you're early on or you know mid career, um, how have you innovated your practice, or what have you learned along the way? So not just what did you learn within the project and what was the result. What are you learning as a researcher that's informing your practice and your perspective? So tying back to Cassie's point about, you know, what are the conversations that you're involved in and why? What are the subjects that you're passionate about? Um, how is your practice evolving as a researcher? And you know you might have a really interesting story to tell um, about you know a particular method or qual versus quan or why you're leaning into a particular thing and what was the reason behind that. So I think there are ways to tie those strands together. Yeah, I see another. If I can answer Seth's question that I see here, which is about an example of a point of view in the field, particularly for research. Um, actually, that's a bummer to hear, Seth, because I feel like research has really gotten its voice out there, but it means we have more work to do. So a really great example, I'm going to name drop for just a second because I think she does incredible work, um, is Vivian Castillo, who was formerly at Salesforce um, and is writing and is just working a ton on empathy in UX and really challenging us to think deeply about what is what is the role of empathy in UX. We kind of use it as a catch-all term and a phrase that we're all supposed to be empathetic and have empathy in our practice. Um, so, you know, really kind of pushing on that as a point of view. So I would say she's an example of a researcher I actually think has a very strong point of view in the field. Um, I think there are spaces if you dig in a little bit and get the opportunity to, um, this is what I'm trying to get to is around like folks who are studying um, trust, practices of trust, how do we build trust into our products? Um, those, those people are very passionate about that topic. Um, if we don't have trust with our, 
users, our customers, our members, whoever we're building for, then what is the product that we are building? Um, and so research will actually typically have a very strong point of view about that. Um, and equity is another example. I think there's a lot of great equity work happening in the last year that people are probably feeling um, better about actually sharing outside of their walls of how do we make sure we're centering misrepresented and underrepresented communities in the work. Um, design is a verb. It's an, act it's an action that we're taking. So who's included in that action that we're taking is really, really critical. Um, and I think you'll, you should and will hear a lot from research on this topic, um, but happy to like point you to some specific examples. If you're not finding them, let us know. And there's always the classic um, dark patterns in UX. So ethics is another field um, that is very rich. Um, and there's a lot of examples in there, but I think, you know, ethics uh, from a research perspective is uh, another one that I would focus on. I think we have one more topic that we can get to. Um, uh, let me know if this is already you feel covered, but just on the topic of like connecting and networking with others through LinkedIn. And we have a questionnaire that can probably set us up. Um, uh, how do we feel about reaching out directly to hiring managers before you apply to a position and what any best, best practices around that? Yeah, um, so I think I actually saw the question too and I was curious about that also. I think there's kind of the option of before or after. Um, so my personal recommendation, this is just my personal recommendation, I'm not speaking on behalf, of, I don't know that we have a point of view as LinkedIn on this. Um, I think having, especially if you're working with a recruiter, if you haven't been in touch with the hiring manager, it probably makes sense to just go and have the conversations and then think about that outreach as a follow-up. It's a really actually great natural place to then come back and say, thank you for your time, or I really appreciated this, or if there were lingering questions that you had as an outreach of like the why am I reaching out part, I think is really helpful um, as a follow-on. Um, and I think hiring managers do respond when we hear from candidates. It's it's never bad to you know take a moment to thank somebody for their time or follow up with a thought or a question. Um, it shows, interest, honestly. Um, I don't necessarily know that I'd expect a response right away, but I think it's 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 still a great signal. Um, the before piece is a little interesting because, you know, um, one of the things that we're really, I think most hiring teams are really conscious of is um, making sure that every candidate has a, 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 a decent and also equitable experience so that we're not like potentially introducing bias into the hiring process at the early stages. So, um, you know, that can be a little tricky sometimes if you don't already have a relationship with the hiring manager or the hiring teams, um, or if you haven't run into them, so, which is why we're, I think we're kind of promoting like networking events or these coffee hours that we're all really fond of is like a great way to start seeding some of those um, relationships with people to leverage. Um, but most of us, if we have relationships, we have to recuse ourselves once you make it into our hiring process, um, since we do have a relationship with you. So hopefully that's helpful. I think if you do, I think Craig talked a little bit about this before, if you do reach out ahead of time is to just be really thoughtful about, you know, what's the purpose of that? Um, what do you want to happen out of that? Um, if it's as simple as just saying, hey, I'm really looking forward to meeting with you later today. Great, that's great. Um, but I don't know that I would front load that piece ahead of time with like questions or a bunch of th thoughts too much before you get the opportunity um, to get time in person one on one or something like that. That helped. Let me see here. I don't think we have the time to start a new topic. Um, any, if anyone who's on the call, you have last questions, just pop, pop them in the chat and we can see if we can rapid fire through them. Uh, and Craig, I don't know if you had any closing thoughts on that final question or just broadly on how, you know, best practices and connecting via LinkedIn. Yeah, just I, I don't know if I said this already, but don't don't send blank connection requests. <laughs> have a put something in there. Have a reason. Um, give the person something to respond to, uh, because you know obviously some people get a lot of requests. If they're all blank, then you know there's not much reason to respond. So that would be my tip. Maybe I'll put up uh, one of the things I think we thought might come up, which maybe it did either earlier, which had to do with a little bit of this like. Um, what how many roles are there out right now so maybe that question has gone away but i think you know post 
well, still in COVID, but post COVID, we saw a lot of, um, unfortunately, you know, furloughs and job loss last year, um, as the entire economy got hit really hard and I, UX was no different. Um, I think one of the things I would just observe, because I was doing a little bit of research on this the other day, is that, um, and hopefully you guys are seeing it too, is that I think we're seeing some really strong recovery in UX right now. I feel like every day I go out and look in the feed, I'm seeing job posts left and right, and kind of at all levels. I think the other pieces around going back to that, like when you're new to the career, um, is seeing really cool opportunities that are starting to come up, like fellowships um, or kind of those entry level roles where you can get you know, into an organization, externships, um, apprenticeships, whatever they're calling it, um, you know, make use of those. But I just wanted to leave on like a note of real optimism because I was very, I was very excited. I did a search actually on our platform just of anything that was kind of called a user experience job. Um, and assuming, you know, obviously I didn't scan those results super, super deeply, but there are over a hundred thousand job posts in this field right now. Um, and that's pretty incredible. Um, and I was really excited to see, um, you know, also just the investment in UX. I think people understand, businesses understand more about UX. We are at a different maturity cycle as an industry. Um, so seeing that really starting to take off, I think was really, really exciting to me. And I hope it is for you guys too. Yeah, and, and location as well. I think the days of like having to apply for a role literally where you live, um, that's obviously changing. So I think, you know, Factoring that into your job search, um, looking at companies that you know they're they're happy to offer rem remote or you know have someone start remote, etc. Um, yeah, that's exciting to see. That's awesome. Just echoing the thoughts that are coming up on chat. Like, thank you so much for joining today, Cassie and Craig, and sharing so much clarity on this topic. Uh, I was like noting stuff down that I have to go and change on my own LinkedIn too. So this is super, super helpful. Um, thanks again. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we'll make the recording available in a few days. Uh, so feel free to share that out as well. Yeah, right. thanks so much, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you. You know where to find us. <laughs> Oh, good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.